Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Soulcast Media Live. If everybody can see me and hear me, give me a thumbs up on your end, just so I know the audio is working. It seems to always work fine on my end, but I always like to make sure and double check with everybody who's here right now. So again, if you can see me, you can hear me, give me a thumbs up, just so I have a good temperature check of the tech situation with these virtual calls. Sometimes you just never know. But again, welcome everybody to our Soulcast Media Live. I'm actually looking at all the folks who have been dialing in, where people are letting us know where you're in from. I was already commenting, telling folks that it's so great to see a lot of people from the States here. Of course, we're here in the US, but we also have folks from around the world. Uh, we have people from Europe, Ireland, Barcelona, Peru. It's going to be a fantastic event. And I'm just so glad that everybody is taking the time, whether it's the morning, the evening, the afternoon here, it's about the early afternoon, which is where I am here in California. So again, welcome everybody to our Soulcast Media Live. Uh, before I invite my guest up, I just want to give everybody some quick tips of what to expect today. If this is your first time joining, again, welcome. I usually keep these Soulcast Media Live sessions about 40 or 45 minutes or so. But my hope is, I want you to know that this is for you. This is for you to really engage with me and my guest, May, who I'm going to invite up in just a little bit. So her and I, we're going to be chatting. And if you guys have any questions for us, May has a lot of great stories to share with you. So if you find anything that she's saying inspiring or you have questions for her or me, throw it in the chat function because I'm looking at it. I'm monitoring it. So I want to be sure to answer any questions that you have. Now, without further ado, I'm going to invite my guest up to join me. So let's see. Let's welcome May Sue. May, hi. How are you? Very good, Jessica. And I see quite a few people from my neck of the woods. Um, I'm in Bethesda, Maryland. So hi, Silver Spring, Rockville. Um, and I was actually at Bay Area last weekend. So very good to be back. So for those who don't know May, let me give May a very warm introduction. So May is, oh my gosh, she's just simply impressive. Now let me tell you why. So May, so she, May, you were born and raised in Asia, in China specifically, in China. and immigrated here to the U.S. And um, I'm, feel free to chime in in terms of your background, but of course you immigrated here, you worked, but then I guess you've always had this entrepreneurial spirit in you, and that's essentially how you started your first company. Actually, it might not have been your first company, but you started what is, I think, one of the most well-known companies, which is Chesapeake Bay Candles. Uh, you worked on it for many, many years, sold it eventually, and now you are running another company, Yes, She May. So let just so everybody knows it may, I don't know if you know this, but the reason why I really wanted to invite you on is because I actually read your book. I don't know if oh. you can see. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Um, very you. good book. Yeah. About entrepreneurship and just resilience and just kind of like that, you know, hard work hustle. So, you know, May, did I miss anything about your background or anything that you want to chime no. in? No, I think I'm also very proud to be a mother of four, two of my own and two stepchildren. Uh, I married second time to an Italian American economist. So I truly feel I am living the American dream and I have understand so much more about cross-cultural communication, which I understand is your goal, Jessica, is to really shine light on the challenges and the joy of being able to live in this culture mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to become really fluent in the language of cross-cultural communication is very difficult. But if you do it well, um, you will be very successful. It's a, it's a land of opportunities for those of us who's multicultural. Exactly. And that's actually why, as you mentioned earlier, this is the topic of the day, because I feel, I mean, it's very clear, you know, May, you and I are both Chinese, right? Uh, even though we, I mean, I was born and raised here in the U.S., but, you know, when people first see us, I mean, they can tell, oh, you're you're Asian, right? right. And 
I always say that it's actually an asset. I, I really truly believe it's an asset. But you know, for me, because my work is communications, communications and knowing how to speak well, work with people, those soft skills, I truly feel is so important for career success or business success if if business or entrepreneurship is where you want to go. So for those who are on this, you know, we have almost like 40 people who are joining us live right now on this, which is fantastic. You know, whether you are, again, you know, born and raised in, you know, in the U.S., just like me or immigrated, I really feel that like there's a lot of things that may you and I, I definitely want to talk to you about in terms of how you are able to leverage this, you know, immigrant kind of like being able to move here to work here and not letting that hold you back. So let's kind of like start with that question. So you immigrated here to the US and I know a lot of people, and that's truly the, uh, the American story. I mean, my parents immigrated here from Asia. How did you use that and not see it necessarily as like a barrier or a disadvantage? How did you use that to your advantage in business? Well, I think, first of all, I would be um, very wrong if I don't mention the year and the situation with which that prompted my decision to move. Um, I was born in 1967, so you can guess I was growing up in one China, which is very closed. Uh, everyone pretty much wear the same uniform and men, women, they wear the same expression. There was not a lot of color, not, not a lot of beauty and, and culture during that time. But interestingly enough, in 1974, uh, President Nixon visited China and made what's called the, the, the week that changed the world. Uh, in 1976, China opened to the world. And in 1979, when I turned 12, I was enrolled in one of the first group of students uh, in, a, in a boarding school to become a student of diplomacy. And it was a very interesting time because uh, those were the times where United States and China was in a honeymoon stage. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of curiosity between each uh, culture to each other. And there was a lot of goodwill. Um, so because they want to uh, really graduate a lot of students that not only speak the language, but also truly understand the cultural, historical, and, uh, you know, social impact of the of the history um we started in the immersion language manner so we would go to a foreign language school and those of us learning english half a day would be uh taught in english uh subject ranging from renaissance art to history of um, european uh, nations so i do feel that was a really good preparation for me and along that way i always thought coming to study would be fun. But my dream was kind of caught short because of 1989. Um, I studied for six years in the boarding school in Hangzhou, which is a beautiful city south of Shanghai. And then I studied another four years in Beijing uh, to really get ready for that next step as a diplomat. But because I was very well trained for such a long time, I was tapped to be a translator for the World Bank that just started having a lot of missions at that time in China. And I was very happy as a student, you can imagine, traveling with the World Bank mission to the regions where they're receiving uh, international aid uh, for development. But the, that dream also was cut short because the year that I graduate was the year of Tiananmen Square. And many of you know about what happened in June uh, of that year, but what you don't know is that the graduating year, graduate usually in July, were all sent away from Beijing to all over the country so that we can get re-educated and not clustered again in the cities. So I would have been watching minerals for export in Northern China for a year. Uh, and that means for a year, I wouldn't be able to practice English or listening even to English. So as a language student, that would be very detrimental. Imagine yourself not speaking and, and practicing for a whole year. So 
that's the entrepreneur side of me. She quit. <laughs> she did. And that was the beginning of uh, my journey here. So I wasn't exactly expecting anything worse. Uh, anything that can put me in touch with the language, with the culture that I had learning uh, would have been better than um, staying, um, watching minerals for export. Right. So essentially, that's the story of how you eventually then you came to the U.S. But let's let the audience know uh, what prompted you to want to start your own business. Uh, a lot of times people have this dream or this notion, but a lot of people don't. And which I always say, entrepreneurship isn't actually for everybody. I have, you know, for example, like my husband, he has no desire to be an entrepreneur, for example, <laughs> right? So it's not for everybody. And I get it. And I think a lot of it has to do with personality um, and things like that. For, so for you, what was it about it that made you go, I want to do my own thing? At that time, it's also out of despair. And I can't imagine why I was so desperate. But um, give you a, a hint, as, a, as an immigrant and a non-green card holder, a student basically, I was learning at University of Maryland journalism as well as mass communication because my role at the World Bank has always been the bridge between the international aid organization with the local community and the government. I realized that uh, you know, there was a lot of um, lack of communication. So we were in northern, northwestern China near, um, near Afghanistan for an investment to create latrines, which is a glorified word for toilets, until we realized they don't want latrines because what they really want is hand pumps. It's a very dry area with a lot of desert, and one does not have enough water to take shower weekly. In fact, people take shower three times a year, I mean, uh, three times in their lifetime, when they are born, when they get married, and when they die. So building a latrine was really not on top of the list they want. And I feel this kind of miscommunication or lack of understanding of the needs of the community need to be addressed in a more systematic manner. And I thought my role would have been to facilitate such dialogue. But when I graduated in 1991, again, I graduated into a year where the U.S. was going to war with Iraq. And that was the first Gulf War. And U.S. has always been the biggest donor to the World Bank. When there is a war, the country put those money on hold, and that means there is a hiring freeze. So once again, I graduated into a challenging situation, and they asked me to you know, find something to do for a few years, May, then we'll hire you back. So that was it. My life is once again on hold and I'm basically on my own. So for myself, uh, applying for uh, a t TV journalism or any kind of reporting work is almost impossible because of my background or my, yeah. my visa. That's when I found a job in New York City and I lived there for a year commuting between Washington, D.C. and New York, because my husband at that time, David, was working here in D.C. and I was living there during the week to work. So that was the time when I was desperate. And what do you do when you're desperate? You kill time. There was no there was no computer and iPhone at that time in 1991, if you remember. And I wasn't really a TV watcher. So I ended up going next door to the Bloomingdale's department store, which is the, the headquarter, right? The flagship. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys had any kind of experience, oh. but for me, it's like a bird out of a cage oh. because I've never seen so much uh, wonderful merchandise oh. and beautiful display. Do you, it's just amazing to see right next door uh, fashion from all over the world, fragrances mm -hmm. from every corner of the, of the, of the globe. But what's really important is that that is when I see an opportunity. So I see an opportunity right in front of me. I didn't think that I could do anything, but that's where a lot of entrepreneurs started. It's not because they are itching to start a business. It's because mm -hmm. they see there is a gap in service, in product, and they wonder why that gap is not closed. Yep. And that is what entrepreneurs do, is that they don't settle they want to do something about it. So I actually, so I love listening to everything that you were just saying, because it's so fascinating. You, you have a very interesting perspective in terms of you're very aware of 
societal context as well of like, okay, what is the environment right now? Is it conducive to getting a job? Is it not conducive to getting a job? If the environment is not, okay, then what do I need to do to pivot, right? So I feel like for you, a lot of times people, sometimes they, they'll just sulk, for example, they'll be like, oh, this sucks, you know, I can't find a job, you know, you know, no one's hiring right now, or it's, I'm not getting what I want, right? So they just kind of stay inside the shell. But for you, you have this awareness of like, okay, I know this is the climate that's going on right now, which is fine. It may be more difficult for me because of my situation, but let me just kind of, and you kind of put it in a funny way, let's just kill time and just see what's going on. (laughs) But because of that, you found that opportunity. And I think that is probably kind of the golden nugget for a lot of interested entrepreneurs. It's, you know, you kind of have to keep your eyes open and just look around. But I want to ask you, so like I said, a lot of people, again, have no desire to be entrepreneurs, but I still think that that mentality is actually quite important. That mentality of opportunity, keeping your eyes open, having a good attitude, I don't know. What do you think in, in a person who's just working um, for a I job? absolutely agree with you. I do feel you don't get to become an entrepreneur because you go and take an MBA classes. I think it's because of um, the mentality. And what is that mentality like? I actually feel there's a lot in common between entrepreneurs and immigrants. Mm. And the thing that are in common is the ability to abandon what they know and what's familiar for the sake of pursuing their passion, they're willing to take a big bet and they're willing to give up everything that is arranged for them, that is set up for them and say, but I will never know what it is like if I try this. Mm -hmm. So they're willing to give up what is comfortable to pursue something completely unknown, but at the end of which could be a big reward. So I always say that's probably why um, we are seeing a lot of entrepreneurs that are actually immigrants. If you look at the Google co-founder, Zoom co-founder, you know, Elon Musk, may I say, is probably one of the most successful entrepreneurs. And he too uh, probably doesn't just say, I'm, you know, I'm settling. I already sold eBay. I don't need to prove anything. Uh, I can, you know, live in my little house that I'm going to build for myself. But I feel it's that spirit to challenge what everybody consider a set way of doing things Mm -hmm. and just take the uncomfortable feeling that you may feel fail uh, spectacularly or you would win equally spectacularly. Yes. And um, that's a passion, I think. It's also a drive. It's a drive. It's a mentality. And like I said, it's not just reserved for people who want to start their own thing. Like if you're working at an organization, stepping out of your comfort zone, uh, doing things that may not be necessarily in your job duty, but it interests you um, are definitely things that can help you grow. Actually, this reminds me of a story. So before I even started Soulcast Media, uh, of course, I was working like a normal person. Uh, but for me, my career was I was a journalist. So when I first graduated university, none of my friends were in journalism. All of them were, of course, going into tech, going into finance, you know, all those like really fancy, you know, big tech jobs. And for me, even though I understand that appeal and I really was also very curious about it, I always had this like interest in pursuing journalism. But in order to do that, I had to move around the country by myself all alone, live in very small cities. And that was really scary to me. And again, this is not me trying to start my own business. This is me just kind of going a little bit sideways and trying to discover something new. Uh, I ended up doing it for 10 years, but that's still the same thing, that curiosity, that mentality, that spirit. I think entrepreneur or not, I think that can follow in any sort of career. Right. And then, you know, compounding the, 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 the opportunity is something remarkable, like the COVID uh, disruption. For people that are seeing the disruption with the eye of an entrepreneur, they will say, okay, everything now is disrupted. Now I get to do a lot of wonderful things. But for many people, they are paralyzed because it's so frightening. It's so different. So again, the mentality 
is a little bit of an optimistic one. Uh, you have to be the kind of person that is glass half full versus yeah. the kind that is glass half empty. And so I feel it's very, I, I would love to see one day a book about the mind of an entrepreneur. And I have a feeling it's going to look different <laughs> at some point if you follow that person, because they probably are more sensitive to um, the cultural shift. Like you mm -hmm. said, we probably have a better social scanning capability in, in sensing the shift that is happening either culturally or economically or both, uh, such mm -hmm. as what we're living now, Jessica. I can't tell you how many times I, 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 I repeat it to my children as well. I said, don't complain. You know, you haven't seen your friends for a year. Just know that you notice everything because every little thing is going to be a big opportunity. It's going to be a huge opportunity. Your optimism, I think, is something that I think a lot of people should be reminded of because it truly is that, right? Like if sometimes it's easy for us to, again, dwell and sulk and say like, oh, this sucks, right? But I think it's it, it's okay to feel that way, but it's not staying that way, right? It's kind of like, okay, this sucks and then let's move on. Exactly. Um, yeah, because we have to be the change that we want to see. And there's no one else that can do it for you. There's nothing that make one feels truly loved if we are not part of it, right? And I think that's another thing that entrepreneurs probably do better is they just don't sit around and complain. They just have to say, if I can't do it, then I can't expect others to do it. Exactly. So it's a spirit. So today is, of course, we're talking about cross-cultural communications for career success. I definitely want to touch upon communications because, of course, like, that's something I'm very passionate about. May, actually, I don't know if you know, but I actually, my major was not journalism. My major was actually international studies. I actually wanted so to be... Switched. <laughs> so we switched. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out in your book, actually, because I thought that this story that I'll, I'll share with you, but that's the story that you told in your book has to do with communications. And I thought it was just so funny. I actually was like laughing when I was reading it. Uh, but before I even get to that, by the way, for those who are joining, I want to, again, welcome everybody. I'm here with May, who is the founder of Chesapeake Bay Candles, and yes, she may. And we're just talking about cross-cultural um, communications, cross-cultural, you know, strategies for career success. But right now, I want to ask May a question about communication. So there was one part in your book, May, about how there was miscommunications with you and one of your biggest vendors, where they were asking you about, I guess, supply. And for wow. you, you kind of felt like you just had to please them, just say, yes, it's yeah. going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Right. But in right. your heart, you're like, no. So That's tell us, happen. yeah, tell us the context of the story. So I was, you know, it's a very good company to work with. Her, the company's called Target Stores. And I was able to start working with them in my fourth year, I think, uh, or third year of business, which is tremendous. And, um, you know, they asked for samples um, and it was going to be next to impossible because all the product at that time was made in our uh, workshop, our, our uh, R&D center in Hangzhou, China, which is our first manufacturing facility. And they want it in a week. As you know, even by DHL, it takes five days, right? I don't have a private jet that can bring one candle all the way from Hangzhou, even without stop. But, you know, the way they, they make this sounds like a most exciting opportunity. It's going to be on the cover of the weekly flyer. You know, they put those in the newspapers and it's going to be for Thanksgiving. So I have to say yes, because I'm also trying to think what happens is that then I don't get that spot in the, in the, so let me figure it out if they can maybe send someone with the sample, you know, from China. But as it turns out, just making the production takes a few days. Mm -hmm. So by the time I realized that I have to fast up, I have to say, you know, in the beginning, I thought it was very difficult, but I tried to make it work. And immediately they look at me and say, so you lied. <laughs> so you lied. And, you know, our culture growing up is that particularly when you are facing your customer, if you just say no up front, mm -hmm. it's considered very arrogant. It's considered you didn't even try to, to do anything about it. You didn't ask your team over there to say, 
if they know of a way to do it, you just say flatly no. So I feel the communication style between Asian countries and particularly Midwestern, I'm not even talking about New York or Los Angeles, I'm talking about Minneapolis mm -hmm. or um, Wisconsin. Those are very different Northern European culture where if you say this is a square, that has to be a square. And if you say this is a white cup, that has to be a white cup. So I, I learned this very early on that they expect you to really not give them the good news up front. They would rather you give them the good news later. But if you have to face them with the truth, you have to. And it's very hard because it sounds just so um, not helpful. You know, I try to be helpful. So the, the lesson I learned is also maybe I'm not feeling confident, right? Maybe in this power struggle, I feel this little vendor called May against this huge corporation called Target Stores. And whatever they say, I can't say no to them because right. that is playing against uh, uh, an egg against a rock, right? Um, how can you win? And then you be looked upon as someone not working too hard for the relationship. So what does that mean to me is that I learned that I actually am not very good setting boundaries also. I'm not very good at educating them that some things are no, doesn't matter how many try, don't try to ask me in different ways because that's never going to happen. And I need to set those boundaries around myself so that we can protect this little vendor so that they can grow. If we don't give the vendor the soil that is healthy, then we're not, we're not going to have healthy fruits at the end of our collaboration. And this really was not just a cultural lesson, Jessica, it's a business lesson, a lesson that I still trying to learn and learn again every single day mm -hmm. um, because it's a very helpful way to understand no matter what dynamics are there, there is ways to arrive at a win-win um, if you are more transparent, if you can be strategic about it. This is why I honestly feel like communications is one of the most important skills in your career in business because so many issues, so many misinterpretations come from that miscommunications. And the story that you shared, May, I really like it because it shows how your own cultural influence of just wanting to please this big vendor, understandably, because it's right. like, wow, I have an opportunity to work with Target. Right. I want to deliver. So you just say, yes, yes, yes. Right. But in their mind, they're thinking, okay, this is the expectation now, right? Right, right, right. But the lesson is, it's like, you know, if anything, the one thing I've learned is sometimes it's better to actually just share the process, right. you know, share the process so they feel continuously looped in so it's not right. like black or white it's just like this is the update this is the update you know what i mean right. and, and i feel like when they feel looped in there's less reason for them to be mad or there's less reason right. for them to you know right. be disappointed so this is again this is a, a general communications lesson in any career really whether and you're I just talking want to build on what you said um jessica it, it's so true that you have to really keep uh, the ch channel of communication really open. Mm -hmm. Another very good advice I have is to provide alternatives. So one of the other lessons that immediately after this lesson I learned is don't go to your client or partner with only the trouble. Also offer the solution. So you can mm -hmm. say, I can't do this, but I can do that. It shows your sincerity. It shows you are not just give them the problem and let them deal with it but you are being a partner. And I train everyone working with me to not come to me because someone else is not here or we can't ship this product, but say someone else is not here, but I find this person or this product is not available, but I find this bag. Um, it trains people to be problem solvers, yes. uh, not just messengers. Um, and it makes us look like a partner and I think that gesture, that that mentality is also very helpful. I completely agree. So, I mean, you mentioned client, but this can be, you know, your boss or supervisor. You know, any boss or supervisor doesn't want an employee just to come in and say, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. Right. You know, they want critical thinking skills. Right. Right. 
Right. And as long as you can show that you thought about a solution, yes. they're more willing to be like, okay, I can tell this person put an effort, then let's kind of troubleshoot it together. Exactly. Exactly. That's so true. And it also helps with marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I have to try to use those methodology to help when, you know, you can imagine we have a cultural, huge cultural uh, gap between the Italians who's born in Italy and in Milano and the Chinese born in Hangzhou. And how do you always uh, agree on the vacation spot or what dinner to have or, you know, other on and on and on. So I, I do feel be a partner means to do this in a transparent way but not be a nagger or complainer, but offer solutions. And exactly. it is probably a, a good lesson um, for my children as well, as they try to negotiate their way in at work and at college and later on with their partners. Um, it's good life lessons. Exactly. Actually, speaking of like relationships and marriage, it's kind of the same thing. It's like if you're asking your partner or your spouse, like, what do you want to eat for dinner? Do you want Italian? No. Do you want American? <laughs> no, I like, always say is no. It's like, yeah. okay, then tell me. Exactly. Yeah, you'll see what's your problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, the, of the, the situation is that you don't want to go out to dinner with me or you have to work. Um, so it's funny because I, I sometimes think about how raising children, working with a team, being with your husband, they're all very similar. I can learn lessons from each experiences and apply it to the other because at the end of the day, we're all humans. We want respect, we want to be heard, and we want to be part of something. And that feeling and need is the same um, no matter what. Beautifully said. And I totally agree. It's not that like when you're at work, you're like a completely different person. You know, the needs are the same. People want to, like you said, be treated the same way with respect. So, you know, this idea of like, oh, I have to put on this persona when I'm at work, I have to act a certain way at work, and then I act a certain way at home. I never say like, that's necessarily the case. It's like, you know, just treat others as other human beings, right? Like if you're at work, like, you know, how do you want to be treated when you're at home? How do you want to be treated? Chances are it's the same. You know, you want to, again, be respected. You want people to engage. You want people to trust, right? It, it's kind of like the same thing. Yeah. Um, one of the other things as, that I wanted to ask you, so again, for everybody who's here, um, oh my God, I can't believe the time just flew. It's already been like 40 <laughs> it's minutes. It's a big conversation. That, that's what I say. I know. Surprise. Right. But May, so one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, I, I asked you this in the beginning, but I feel like there's still so much we can talk about this, you know, for people who feel like an outsider, okay, for people who feel like an outsider, whether it's in their current job and their team, their organization, when they feel like they don't necessarily fit in, which I sometimes feel a lot of immigrants feel this way. Uh, how do you how did you deal with not letting that affect you and your confidence and just kind of charging ahead because you needed to how do you not let that foreigners you know feeling that outsider feeling get in the way well i often feel that way not only because um i was an immigrant the first time i moved here even today i would be going to an event and i would say i come from maryland and there will be people like but really, where you come from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and someone like my husband, if he doesn't open his mouth and nobody realizes he's Italian, they will never ask that question, yeah. right? Um, so I wouldn't call it discrimination per se, but there is a clear uh, difference between me being an Asian American woman and many others. There are times when we would be in a board meeting and I'll be the only woman, or there will be times when I... I mean, an event, and I'll be the only uh, female and Asian. So while these times, um, you know, I often feel a little bit out of my elements, um, what I thought really helped is to find a way to break the eyes by finding common grounds. So remember, I was trained as a diplomat. And in diplomacy, one of the most important weapon is finding common interest. And let's just say, you know, that's how guys always talk about soccer, always talk <laughs> about football, right? There is a reason because they can't talk about their emotions or how I feel at work or how do they think about that promotion that Jack got. Yeah. But they can talk about how they feel about that loss 
uh, you know, of one game. Yeah. So I do feel it's a very good strategy is to find common ground. Um, because I love fashion, I often end up starting with what people wear. I find that even guys are very passionate about something, you know, it can be their shoe or it can be something about their socks, which is very funny. And I say, you, you notice that, that I'm wearing green spiders? I said, yeah, who would notice that? It's so obvious. But he was very happy that I picked up on the green spider socks. So I think finding common grounds and make it fun is not only very important to relax uh, yourself, it's really important to show your humanity because not everybody can read you, right? Um, some people may think you are very reserved or you're very rigid or because I'm a CEO, sometimes they think I don't want to talk to anybody. You have no idea. I talk now. I practice all the time. I talk to anybody around me when I'm waiting in lines at the airport. I talk to the janitors. I talk to the, the coffee makers. My husband said, do you know these people? <laughs> because he would be looking at me talking nonstop. And he said, do you know these people, May? Because he was actually very curious. Like, how do you know these people? I said, I don't know them, honey. I just find they're very interesting. I ask about their children. I ask how early they come to work. How do they come to work? And he said, but are they, are they interested in talking to you? I said, guess what? I'd probably be the first one asking that question to them. And someone would be very thankful that they're worth talking to. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we take everyone's life for granted. It's like we have a wall, uh, uh, invisible wall, and we don't want to know about other people's life, and we don't want to be told. We, we don't want to be asked. But yeah. sometimes that ask is the best thing they need. Sometimes it's a sign of we are alive. You know, people notice me. That's it. So you touched on a few things that I I'm a, I completely agree on, and and this kind of and this honestly this is part of career success really. It's understanding the art of small talk, which I know a lot of people are like, oh, I hate small talk. It's so awkward, right? But I think if you start from a place of curiosity and just like observe, like you are like you notice that guy's socks, right? You know, and I think people appreciate that kind of stuff. And then you said finding common ground. I um the last. Person, or not the last person, but one of the guests I had here, he's the CEO of Citibank, or chairman of Citibank in Asia. And he said the same thing. And he said, you know, for him, because a lot of it's about like client relationships, right. he comes in and he says, I just try to talk about things that are universal, food, right. travel, right. Uh, you know, things that people will generally light up about. Because most times, People don't want to go straight into business. Right, like, exactly, you know? exactly. And I have also found that uh, particularly when you seem to be of, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say you're of a lower position, but for young people, when they start working for a very big organization and they spot their CEO or chairman of the board and they wanted so much to talk to them, but they don't even know how to say anything, right? So that's a perfect moment for you to, use what you learn about them you know if they like um fly fishing you know people don't just like fly, uh there's no one that just like fly fishing they love fly fishing who else what what else why would they be standing in the middle of the water and doing nothing but you know flying their their uh uh you know equipment so they have to have a passion for that if you can pick up those things it's not called being too shrewd but i do feel being able to pick out something that you feel comfortable enough to talk about is very important. You don't have to pretend like if you don't play golf and you have to talk about, and then immediately you're going to expose your weakness. Yeah. Talk about things you love and it will come off very naturally. And a lot of the busy CEOs, they also are very awkward when they realize everyone's afraid of them and they don't know how to approach them. So it takes two to tango. And it's true for everyone. A lot of times people get very intimidated by people's titles. But right. in the end, you know, they're just humans. Chances are, you know, they have kids. They, they're right. silly. You know, they have personality. Right. Another um, very safe topic is pets. Uh, <laughs> yes. Everybody likes cats and dogs. Um, <laughs> people. Those are always safe topics. Exactly. And I think, so for me, like when I was like a journalist, right, back, back way then, you know, 
I had just graduated college. So I was like 21 years old. So for me, I really had to learn, okay, if I'm going to approach this politician, for example, right. you know, right. I could have said, who am I? A 21 year old young girl going up to this, like, you know, big politician, the governor of whatever <laughs> state. That's right. I, that's the thing. I can't let myself think that way or else I will diminish myself. Yeah, you become a shrinking violet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I realize, yeah, I realize the one thing that always works, it's, it's really your energy, right? Yeah. Your, your enthusiasm. You know, if you go up to somebody who seems intimidating, for example, but you just say, hey, I really like your suit and just leave right. it at that. That's all you really have to say, but you yes. come with that energy and that enthusiasm and people right. gravitate towards that. Yes. Even the present deserves a compliment. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> even, the, even the most smart, the smartest CEO, the Nobel Prize winners, they could use a compliment. Exactly. And, they're, they're not, a compliment. <laughs> exactly. and then, you know, maybe all they'll say is thanks, but, you know, chances are they'll turn around, they'll look at you, they'll notice you, and then they'll be like, thanks. And then, you know, if there's a perhaps a second encounter, you know, they may start to recognize you, but it's, it, it slowly builds like that. You don't go from zero to 100, you yes. know, that quickly. Yes. So. Yes. Um, so May, I mean, we are about wrapping up here. I'm having just so much fun. I know. I think it's been fun too. It's such um, a great topic. You know, it really applies to everyone. And I think we already have some great comment. I think one of the, the the guy that has to leave early really liked the fact of, you know, we are all humans. Yes. Even if we come from different culture, th there are many similar um, sort of basic needs. Um, and I feel as long as we respect others, just like how we respect our own family and our um our own community, you know, it's a lot easier. Absolutely. So, I mean, we have a few minutes left. If anybody has actually has any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat. But as we are, you know, kind of wrapping up here, May, is there anything that you want to share with the people who are watching who, you know, thank everybody who stayed on and just hopefully you enjoyed this chat with me and May. I do. I do. Um, I, I have to say, you know, one of the things I think the pandemic has brought on is the ability to go into different groups now, right? Uh, Jessica, you started a group and then there are others. So I, I feel the spreading of the words. It's another helpful way to not only help others, but also increase your own influence, right? Nobody gives you influence if you don't show it. Um, and people become influencers because they put themselves in that position and if you act enough, you become one. So I do feel we have to um, spread good words um, for a project like yours. Um, I'm helping women uh, businesses. If you know of any women designers, that's a place you can find a, a lot of sort of same, um, sort of similar spirited people. And we cannot build our communities without others to, um, you know, help us. So I'm happy to help. Um, not only those who's here, but if you happen to know anybody who wants um, to work with women-owned businesses. So, and I'm sure Jessica can have more um, person to interview because the more uh, we hear from everyone, the more wisdom we gain. Yeah, um, you said something that's so true, you know, with because of the world that we live in today with technology and, and with the pandemic also kind of like, you know, fast tracking a lot of like virtual types of things, you know, right. the opportunity for people to kind of showcase their thought. I talk about thought leadership a lot, but, uh, you know, you know, sharing your own thought leadership, your own ideas, like that is how actually, actually people who want to get noticed even within their organization, Right. If you just talk about what it is that you're passionate about, you know, whatever industry you're in, people want to work with those people. You know, people yes. want to work with people who have thoughts, who have ideas. Right. right? Exactly. Yes. Ideas so, are very important. And it is what drives a lot of the uh, entrepreneurship, too. So um, it's a test because sometimes you feel you don't want to speak in so many in front of so many people. It sounds a little bit uh, arrogant to to speak so much. Uh, it's always a fine balance, I found. My husband said I talk too much. <laughs> so in a situation like this, I would say I definitely talked a lot, 
but you know, I I hope that people take it uh, from me that um, being an immigrant is a plus, it's an advantage because you have a very unique perspective. Uh, being an outsider also is an advantage. It allows you to see things that people inside does not always see. So it can always go both ways. Absolutely. And actually, one of the last things that I want to share with people is, you know, visibility is very important for a career. Um, right. And it's not about getting in people's faces and, and, and again, like talking a lot. It's, right. it's really about showcasing your ability and not shying right. away from showing people that you're capable, you can handle mm -hmm. things, and you can get right. things done. I always say, and I think a lot of, maybe you can relate to this, mate, but I think a lot of like Asian culture is like, you know, you just kind of do the work and and, and try to just kind of stay on the DL, on the down low. Right. Right. Don't, I mean, any culture really, you have to, if you do something good, tell people about it, let people yeah. know, you know? Yeah. yeah. So we have to always promote ourselves because no one else is hired at this point <laughs> you have to hired be for promoting yourself and no one else will be hired until you hire yourself first. Yeah. So um, that, that is what I told my children. I said, you can't just lie down there and get a job, you know, without showing up. Um, and you have to say something nice about yourself. Otherwise no one's going to pick you up to do, to do work with them. Um, yeah, I, I feel the personality um, that really wings is the one that is open, is curious, and it's optimistic. Mm -hmm. And you have to be your own best advocate. I mean, truly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, very true. So, Jessica, this is a very fun conversation. And when I go to uh, Orange County next, I'll knock on your door. Please do. Whenever yes. I head over to the East Coast, I will let you yes, know as please. well. That's the way we... Uh, we get to strengthen our, um, you know, our our relationships because I, I think there's so much going on, and it's good to carve out some time to Absolutely. to 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 have a dialogue like this. Of course. So May, thank you again. So if people want to find you, they want to find out a little bit more about your business. I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Send me a message, and I'm here. Um, my book is called Burn. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on Amazon. And if you are interested in working with women owned businesses, my website is Yes, She May. Um, it's a play of my name, but it's actually She and May. <laughs> so, well, again, May, I want to thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. And for everybody who joined and stayed in our and like listened to our conversation, hopefully you feel a bit inspired because that's my hope with these talks. Obviously, it's communications related, but it's for you to always feel that you are in control more than you think, especially when it comes to communications and also understanding how to work with other people so you can have more career success. Again, thank you everybody for joining. We do these Soulcast Media Lives about two times a month. So our next one will be at the end of November. So if you haven't already RSVP for that, go on our website, soulcastmedia.com. That's where we post it or get on our newsletter because that's also where we announce our events as well. So again, May, thank you again. And thank you, thank everyone. you everyone for joining. I'll talk to Indeed. you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful holiday season. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.